Welcome to another episode of Underworld Diary. If you've been enjoying the stories we share here, feel free to hit the like and subscribe buttons to help the channel grow. In today's episode, we will explore a significant city in the history of organized crime that many don't associate with the Mafia at all. Cleveland. Even though it may not be one of the major cities that come to mind when you think of Mafia activity over the last few decades, Cleveland has had its share of prominent figures and profitable rackets. From its inception in the early 1900s, the infamous bombing wars with Irish gangster Danny Green, all the way to the modern-day family, this video looks to break down the significant figures and events that the Mafia in this city has been connected to throughout their history. The first known involvement of Mafia activity in the city of Cleveland dates back to roughly 1905. Around this time, Italians began immigrating to the area, looking to start a new life. However, mixed in with the legitimate citizens immigrating to America were individuals with ties to organized crime in Sicily. Landing in Cleveland in the early 1900s, the city saw multiple crews associated with the Black Hand organization setting up extortion rings. These extortion rings targeted almost everyone throughout the area, including the newly immigrated countrymen and women. This extortion became extremely lucrative at this time, which inevitably led to an increase in violence. With the not-so-organized crews warring back and forth with each other and other gangs in the region, Cleveland began to see many murders connected to the Black Hand. This prompted the local police to crack down on individuals they believed were associated with the Black Hand, with mixed success. Members of the organization then split into smaller, more region-based gangs throughout Cleveland. From these splintered crews eventually emerged two major Italian-American gangs in the area, including the Sarah Gang and the Benino Gang. The Serra Gang was founded and led by local gangster Angelo Serra. Serra's gang was said to be the more organized of the two and was reported to specialize in automobile theft and document forgery. This gang was extremely financially successful, making what would be millions in today's money. This crew differed from the Benino Gang, which was formed by another local gangster, Dominic Benino. This crew was said to be much less organized and made sporadic income through a variety of crimes, including payroll robberies, armed robberies, and property theft. This gang was the smaller of the two and was seen as the B-team in terms of growing Italian-American crews in the region. However, as Cleveland and the rest of the states entered the 1920s, the landscape of organized crime shifted as they entered the Prohibition era. As was the case for many organized crime groups across America, Prohibition saw a time of immense change and profit throughout the criminal landscape. Specifically in Cleveland, multiple gangs saw the lucrative opportunity that Prohibition provided, leading to the formation and strengthening of several smaller gangs throughout the region. With these gangs primarily being run by new immigrants, a combination of Jewish, Irish, and Italian gangs rose and grew throughout Cleveland. The city overall saw an increase in illegal distilleries, speakeasies, and brothels, creating a haven for people looking to gamble, drink, and participate in other outlawed activities. Both the Benino and Sarah gangs were said to participate in the bootlegging business, creating even more profit for their crews. However, it would be a new crew that used Prohibition as a way to climb the ranks of the Cleveland underworld. This crew was the combination of two newly immigrated families, the Leonardo and Porello families. The brothers of these families originally came together in the early 1920s, with the four Leonardo brothers and the seven Porello brothers fusing a combination of legitimate and illegitimate businesses at this time. As Prohibition came around, the crew dropped most of the legitimate businesses to focus on building their bootlegging operation. The second oldest Leonardo brother, Joseph Big Joe Leonardo, became the leader of this crew, with Joseph Porello becoming second in command. This created a massive business-minded crew with strong familial ties in an area with no official leadership. Taking advantage of this, the new crew run by Leonardo became the most powerful Italian gang in Cleveland. Making a massive profit from Prohibition, the crew expanded throughout Cleveland and was seen as the first official mafia family in the city. However, despite their rise to the top, the family soon started to experience internal strife, leading to an inter-family war starting in 1927. Dividing the strong crew into two factions, the Porello brothers separated from the Leonardo brothers, creating their own operations. This operation directly competed with the Leonardo's operations and quickly escalated the tension between the two new factions. The tension continued to grow until October of 1927, when Joseph and his brother John agreed to have a sit-down with the Porello leadership. Arriving at the agreed meeting spot, 
the two brothers were ambushed by multiple gunmen and shot and killed while playing cards. This was alleged to be ordered by Joseph Porello, allowing him to take over the mafia in Cleveland. The notion of Porello taking over the Cleveland Mafia through the violent double murder of his former allies did not sit well with many in the Cleveland underworld. Leonardo was said to be extremely well connected throughout the region, having the backing of Jewish gangs in the area, as well as another Italian-American gang called the Mayfield Road Mob. This gang, headed by Frank Milano, looked to avenge Leonardo and retake the lucrative rackets that Porello now held. Seeing the growing tension brewing from Leonardo loyalists, Porello sought backing from the powerful New York families to protect himself and his standing. Hosting a meeting for powerful New York bosses, said to include Joe Profaci, Porello got the backing he wanted from New York and was officially named the boss of the Cleveland Mafia. With this backing, Porello went back to running his family under the impression that he would now be respected as the boss. However, the rival faction, now officially headed by Frank Milano, seemed not to care about New York's sign-off and continued the fight for control of Cleveland. This feud saw the second-in-command of the Porello family, Sam Tadaro, being murdered only months after Porello was dubbed the boss of Cleveland. This was followed by the murder of multiple other members and supporters of the Porello family, rapidly weakening the family's strength. At this time, Milano was seen to have the majority of support in the underworld, which led to Porello calling a meeting between the two to settle the conflict. Arriving at this meeting, Porello and one of his associates were ambushed, shot, and killed. This murder saw Joseph's younger brother, Vincenzo Porello, becoming the new boss of Cleveland. However, he too was murdered three weeks after his brother was killed. His brother Raymond then took over the family, only to see his house blown up one month later. Seeing the violence coming their way, the remaining associates of the Porello faction opted to join the Milano crew, making them the new official mafia family in Cleveland. This claim was later backed by New York in 1931. Milano held much more control over the family than Porello and refocused the family on making money. Being successful as a boss, Milano was said to receive a seat on the commission in 1932 and was seen as a prominent boss in the American Mafia. But before he could truly focus on his family, Milano wiped out the remaining members of the Porello faction. Alleged to have ordered the murder of Raymond and Rosario Porello in 1932, Milano officially ended the war between the two factions. This led to a period of relative peace in Cleveland for the next few years until Milano moved to Mexico to avoid tax evasion charges. In hiding, Milano placed his right hand man Alfred Polizzi in charge of the family. Polizzi had a somewhat uneventful time at the top, continuing to run the family's various rackets until 1944 when he was arrested and convicted on charges of tax evasion. Going off to prison, Polizzi passed the family off to a up-and-coming gangster who ended up becoming the longest-lasting boss in Cleveland Mafia history, John Scalish. John Scalish was a respected and reputed gangster throughout most of the 30s and 40s. Seen as a savvy businessman, Scalish was seemingly the right man to help guide the family into the new world of the Mafia. Venturing away from the years of prohibition, Scalish sought to expand the family's operations to include major gambling operations and union racketeering. He was said to have close ties to high-ranking members in the Genovese family as well as the boss of the Chicago outfit, Tony Accardo. By forming these connections, Scalish was able to expand his family's operations to Las Vegas, LA, and Florida, where they were said to be involved in skimming operations from multiple casinos. Also said to be involved in the construction phases of these casinos, Scalish and his family were connected to notable casinos in Las Vegas including the Desert Inn Hotel and Casino. These business ventures turned a significant profit for the family and saw them reach their peak membership in the mid-50s, with the family having an estimated 60 members. During this time, Scalish continued to make connections with other surrounding families, becoming tied to the Pittsburgh, Kansas City, and Milwaukee Mafia, where they participated in joint illicit ventures. Making an alleged tens of millions over this time, Scalish was able to build the family to its peak without much pushback from law enforcement or rival factions. Looking to continue growing his family in the upcoming years, Scalish somewhat unexpectedly passed away in 1976, at the age of 64, during open-heart surgery. Scalish's sudden death shook up the stability that the Cleveland family had and unofficially marked the beginning of their downfall. Following the death of Scalish, who ran the family for over 30 years, James Jack White LeCavalier was voted the new boss of the family. 
Lecavalier was connected to the Detroit Mafia, said to have worked alongside prominent members of the family during the years of Prohibition. However, he eventually moved to Cleveland, where he became closely associated with the Mafia in the region, quickly rising to a high-ranking member. His time as boss started relatively the same way Scalish's ended, but unfortunately for him, his tenure as boss would be almost completely intertwined with the infamous Danny Green War. This war, covered in more depth in a previous video, saw a notorious Irish mobster go to war against the Cleveland Mafia. The war started in 1976 following the murder of the then underboss of the Cleveland Mafia, Calogero Masseri, said to be executed by an associate of Danny Green's. Following this killing, the Cleveland underworld was torn apart, with over 40 car bombings taking place. Green, able to avoid multiple assassination attempts over this time, was eventually murdered in 1977 in a car bomb outside of his dentist's office. The men said to be responsible for the successful hit, Ferrido, would turn government informant, providing information on the higher-ups in the Cleveland Mafia. With this information, Lecavalier was eventually arrested on RICO charges related to the murder of Danny Green and received a 17-year sentence. Following Lecavalier's imprisonment, Angelo Lonardo, the son of the murdered Joseph Lonardo, took over the Cleveland Mafia. His time at the top was extremely short-lived, as in 1984 he was arrested for his involvement in running a massive drug trafficking ring. Surprisingly, following this arrest, Leonardo became a government informant, providing information on multiple different Mafia families throughout the US. With the former boss becoming an informant, the Cleveland Mafia lost significant power and was ostracized by the Mafia overall. However, the family still opted to promote John Peanuts Tronoloni to the boss's position. He was able to stay in the position for five years before he too was arrested in 1989 after accepting jewelry from an undercover police officer to cover a loan sharking debt. He, in turn, was sentenced to nine years in prison but passed away before serving this time. Entering into the 1990s, Anthony Tony Lib Liberatori allegedly took over the extremely weakened family but was also arrested quickly in 1993 for money laundering. This saw the family being almost completely dismantled with almost no members left on the street. Heading into the 2000s, the family saw a brief period of rebuilding through their connections with the Chicago and Detroit families. But they again faced backlash from law enforcement with the new boss, Joseph Iacobacai, being arrested. Leading into the current day, it is alleged that the family still exists in a very weakened state with Russell Popolardo reported as being the head of the family. Thank you for watching another episode of Underworld Diary. If you enjoy the stories told on the channel, feel free to hit the like and subscribe button to help the channel grow. If there are any topics you would like to see covered in future videos, feel free to leave a comment down below, if not, I will see you next time with another story from the underworld.